All of that was true. As of this morning, when I left my house, I still just had one wife and three children. <clears throat> Only one cat was accounted for. <clears throat> <laughs> the, other, the, the other one didn't die. I think he just was walking somewhere. Um, Luckily, all my demands have been fulfilled for speaking today. I asked for a podium, plant, and an American flag. Everything's represented. I own uh, Raygun, which is best known for t-shirts. Uh, this is one of ours. Vowel-based humor plays well in a state where three out of four uh, letters are vowels. Ohio is the only one who can really match us. Uh, one of the oldest ones we have, Des Moines Helios. Uh, welcome to Crown Town. We have a store in Kansas City and their local baseball team was recently in a tournament. It was kind of a big deal, but um, a lot of people think that all we can do is put words on t-shirts. We can also put words on other things. Uh, mug, bacon-based humor is big now. <clears throat> Koozies, really descriptive koozie. Uh, coasters. Uh, notebooks, the one on the right, uh, all the guys should take. The, the, the person who buys this the most are normally middle-aged women buying it for their teenage sons. <laughs> so just when you think your mom only embarrasses you when you are around, she's coming into clothing stores and talking to strangers about how you draw cartoon penises. Uh, we'll do posters. This one matches the shirt I'm wearing. Postcards. Uh, one of my favorites is Iowa, where literally everybody is an old white farmer. <clears throat> Uh, we do all of our screen printing on site. This is a picture of me printing, although nowadays I only print when people ask to take a picture of me printing. Uh, we have staff to do that for me. We opened the store in 2005. Back then I did do all the printing. Uh, that's the capital in the background. This is an artist's rendering of the store. This is not an actual photograph. Uh, we're moving into a new building in 2015. Uh, Envision Architecture designed it for us. I think Laura was here earlier. Uh, this will be next spring. This is a lot bigger. We actually are just on the corner. There's a law firm above us, so we're not going to be the size of a crate and barrel. <clears throat> Although, something to shoot for, selling overpriced plates and sofas. Uh, this is Iowa City. We're on the Penn Mall. People have thrown up in front of this store. Uh, 2014, we opened up in Kansas City. That's the year we're currently in, in case you guys are still signing your checks, 2013. Uh, we have something called a website, so if anyone has an internet connection, they can purchase things online. We also wholesale to other little stores like Mohair Pear and Cedar Falls, etc., etc. Uh, all of the custom screen printing is done by 87 Central. So this tests everybody's listening skills to see who approaches me afterwards and asks me to do custom printing for them. In 2009, we split the company in half. Uh, half was 87 Central to do custom printing, half was Raygun to do the retail and printing. 8-7 is just around the corner from us, and we have a non-compete. <clears throat> We've got a nice team of people. I forgot to add somebody. This is us all in cartoon form. Uh, there are, uh, I guess now 12, we have to add one, 12 full-time people, uh, roughly 15 part-time people on the ray gun side, depending on how many high schoolers we had to fire over the summer for not showing up to work. Uh, sales, strong, too quite strong. That's our chimpanzee CEO. <clears throat> we sell about $3 million per year across all sides, and I've gotten to do some neat things over the years. Um, in 2009, bizarrely enough, I wore a tie. <clears throat> uh, I also, I was addressing Congress. I spoke to the Ways and Means Committee on Healthcare Reform for some reason. Uh, I got, in 2004, invited to meet John Stewart at The Daily Show, which was a dream come true. <laughs> this spring, I was on a Prairie Home Companion at the Civic Center with Garrison Keeler. That's Garrison Keeler standing extremely close to me. Um, I was a contributor to an NPR show called Middle Ground, it didn't last long. And I also spoke at TEDx Fargo, which was not a dream necessarily, but a friend of mine who lives in Fargo asked that I mention Fargo in all of my talks. So, Fargo. <clears throat> and then in uh, 2008, I was on C-SPAN. When I first moved back to Des Moines, I would print t-shirts in my parents' basement and watch a lot of C-SPAN. <laughs> I don't know if that was the only channel we got in the basement. And so C-SPAN came into the store one day and I said, oh, it's always been my dream to be on C-SPAN. And they said, hey, we can make that happen right now. And the next morning, they had me talking about things on C-SPAN. In 2012, I uh, wrote a book, which was something I had wanted to do for a long time. I guess since I was 13. Before that, I wanted to be a paleontologist uh, before that. I wasn't really forming a lot of long-term memories because I was under the age of six. <clears throat> but there was a time when I had potential. <laughs> I could have been something. I grew up in Van Meter. Uh, I lived there from 1982 till 2000. This is a visual approximation of my life 
my wife. Uh, I am portrayed by a small girl, and there's my parents, uh, played by Kevin Costner and somebody else. Uh, the gentleman in the baseball uniform is my grandfather. Some of you may be wondering why my grandfather is younger than my dad. It's a long story. Uh, I had wanted to leave Iowa, which I did in 2000. This is a visual approximation of me getting out of Dodge. It's like everything out of here. It had always been my dream. I was like, I'm gonna live on the East Coast, uh, which is an extremely easy dream to fulfill. There are several clearly marked exits. The East Coast speaks English and takes American currency. I enrolled at the University of Pennsylvania to study history, primarily because it was an Ivy League school. Pretension. Uh, unfortunately, not the best name recognition in the Midwest. Everyone's like, Nittany Lions? <clears throat> uh, which is a real kick in the groin, because if you go to an Ivy League school, the sole purpose of going is so that total strangers will think you are smarter than them, not attending a Big Ten university with phys physical education issues. Penn, most famously, uh, is the home of William Henry Harrison. <laughs> I'd be flabbergasted if anybody knew that. Uh, our shortest serving president died in 80 days. Um, also, Donald Trump went there, and all his a-hole kids went there. <clears throat> um, like, hey, if you knew him. Uh, Michael Milken, the junk bond king, also went to Penn, studied business. The junk bond prince probably went to Penn State. Uh, when I got there, I wasn't really sure essentially what to do, except commence what David Brooks described as becoming a resume god. So <clears throat> when you leave high school, you think to yourself, oh, I'm gonna go on to college. It's all about like big ideas, following my dreams. Instead, it's more like high school on steroids. So you wanna to put together this hulking resume that everyone else will fear. So uh, number one goal, high GPA. <laughs> Don't take any class, you can't get an A in. Uh, number two, travel to show you're curious about other cultures. Uh, number three, find maybe a downtrodden child to mentor so you can show you have a soft side. So it's like, yeah, I'm applying to be a banker at Goldman Sachs, but one day I wanna start an NGO to help uh, orphans in Nicaragua. Uh, I commenced with that. I went to Germany my summer. This may or may not be where I actually lived. Uh, my grades got me the McNeil Scholarship to St. Andrews in Scotland. I lived down the street from Will and Kate. Unfortunately, my invitation to the wedding was lost in the mail. Uh, in 2004, I returned to Penn, and I thought to myself that I really enjoyed other people paying for my education, and maybe I should continue that. So I found something called the Turon Fellowship. It would give you a master's. You can go to whatever school you want. They'll pay for your tuition, room and board, and then just because they're nice, they give you a little walking around money. This was an extremely competitive fellowship. Uh, 200 to 300 people apply. Uh, in December, I found out I was one of like 20 finalists, and they take four people, and I was like, well, I'll be modest for a second. There's a chance, however remote, that I'm not first or second. I'll entertain anything. Uh, but I'm definitely in the top four. <clears throat> so I figured I would go to St. Andrews again, get a master's in international relations, conceivably over that year figure out what international relations is. I would go on, stay in the UK, get a PhD in the European Union in uh, Oxford, LSE, really wherever I wanted to go. I'd either teach or get a job in Brussels. Uh, at the EU headquarters. This would be expatriate Mike, I'd obviously be in better shape. <laughs> uh, wife, strange friend who would try to kill me later. Um, and occasionally I'd come back to like Van Meter and wow the locals with my continental sensibilities and be like, Van, you ban dance in here? <laughs> you people are so provincial. Uh, really, this success series poster summed it up. You know, attitude determines your altitude. And I had a winning attitude. The only problem is that I got rejected for the fellowship. <laughs> what? <laughs> I kind of expected more of like an, oh. Even, yeah, see, there you go. <clears throat> I was like, if there's one thing this crowd can do, it is react when prompted. Um, I've highlighted the big parts, not been selected, wishing you every success. <laughs> and then they tell you the four people that did get it so you can Google them 10 years later and be like, you took my spot. <clears throat> I was able to reevaluate my entire life, though. I was like, I feel like it's gonna be a great day. Um, a friend of mine, I kind of noticed that I had made no other plans except winning this fellowship, so I had the next 65 years of my life free, I guess 61 years of my life free if I took up smoking, uh, nine and a half years of my life free if I took up riding a motorcycle without a helmet. And so when a friend suggested that we start selling t-shirts, I was like, 
Why not? <laughs> this is the best option I've got. When you are a senior at an Ivy League school and you start selling t-shirts on the street, that is what you call rock bottom. Uh, strangely enough though, I really enjoyed it. Uh, we made 100 t-shirts, I stood on campus and sold them. And then when we sold them, I made 100 more t-shirts and I would stand on campus and sell them. It's not like one of these really complicated tech uh, business models where I have to like explain how the banking system works. Uh, if, if you can't understand this business model, <laughs> I'm not sure how far, how, how you've advanced this far in high school. <clears throat> um, when I graduated, uh, I moved on to selling t-shirts on other streets. I would go up to New York, I'd go to Boston, so this is uh, Times Square, I would stand and sell goods, I'd go to Union Square, Columbia, I'd look around, usually at the other street vendors, and be like, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say I'm the only person with an Ivy League degree here. <laughs> uh, in 2005, my dad was like, you're like Willie Loman, you're a traveling salesman. I was like, I'm looking for more of a positive salesman figure than the guy from Death of a Salesman. Uh, I moved back to Iowa, I got on a plane from New York to Los Angeles and they parachuted me down halfway in between. <clears throat> and then I opened up what was then called Smash in the East Village, 2005. Uh, the city had been waiting for it forever. It opened up to great fanfare, what I would call light, to moderate <laughs> fanfare. This is our first month. Total store sales, 2,978. Which doesn't sound too bad, but that's only about $99 per day, which is about three transactions per day, which is about one transaction for every two and a half hours. Uh, I would work 70 ta 72 hours a week. Staff, one extremely charismatic employee. <clears throat> uh, that is a lot of time to sit in a store and think of how you should have gone to law school. But if you're gonna start at the bottom, that's where it goes. Uh, 2006, that was a long year of working. I worked by myself that whole year. 2007, I got my first employees. 2008, we took over more space. 2009, split the company in a rig on 87 Central. Uh, 2010, sold 87 Central, opened up in Iowa City. 2011, we created a line of jeans and almost bankrupted the company. 2012, we wrote a book and saved the company. 2013, not a lot of note, happened this year, um, but I leave it on there because it would be weird if I left it off. 2014, we opened up in Kansas City, I spoke in Ames, Waukee High School, fulfilled a dream. 2015, we're gonna open up a bigger space in Des Moines, and by 2016, uh, we'll probably become billionaires, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm assuming. And weirdly enough, it all wouldn't have happened without the rejection letter, which turns out to be the, literally the greatest thing that could have ever happened to me. <laughs> when I step back and assess my life of what I do now, uh, I pretty much love everything I do. I have the greatest job in the world. Um, I do whatever I want. Anything I ever wanted to do growing up, I have more or less accomplished. Had I gotten this fellowship, I probably would not have liked anything I would have gone on to do. I was on what I would call the totally wrong path for academia. Strangely enough though, we never would have actually written a book, fulfilling another dream, had we not made a line of jeans in 2011. The only reason why we made the jeans <clears throat> was that other stores were making jeans. We viewed ourselves as a clothing store that printed t-shirts. And so we said, well, what do other clothing stores do? Well, they got into cut and, cut and sew stuff. They go over to China, uh, make jeans. So we should do that too. Um, so we went over to China and we were like, hey, uh, we need 3,000 pairs of jeans pronto. They're like, we can do that. There was one tangible issue once we got them. Uh, we were not making money selling jeans. <laughs> Uh, a thousand of the jeans that we got initially were unusable and you don't really call the Shenzhen Better Business Bureau and be like, hey, I've got a complaint to file against one of your 400 jeans factories. <laughs> um, the biggest thing was that the jeans weren't selling nearly as fast as the t-shirts, which means our money was tied up in inventory rather than cash. And unless you can start paying for your rent in jeans, uh, that's pretty tricky. I made about minus $20,000 that year, which my wife was excited about. <clears throat> the intangible issue, uh, was that we weren't playing to our advantages. We realized that instead of being a clothing store that printed t-shirts, we were a print design store. Uh, people came in for the slogans. And by viewing ourselves as a clothing store and looking at other clothing stores, we were letting other people dictate the rules to us. Uh, the advantage of running a company is that you get to pick your competition. There's no extra points for hurdling a nine foot fence. <laughs> find a one foot fence, step over it. Um, we needed to pick a field where we had some natural advantages. <clears throat> With the book, we had natural advantages in it. Uh, we were good at writing, we were good at slogans, we had an audience in the Midwest, we had subject matter that we knew would sell, 
And so we spent about nine months putting the book together. Uh, and at the same time, we shifted the whole feel of the store. So if you walk through the store now, almost everything is slogan-based that kind of breaks down from the book to posters to shirts to postcards. Um, the one thing I wonder is, if you are so smart, how do you keep messing things up so frequently? <laughs> A lot of people would think, oh, that, you know, when you walk into the store, we're just like some guys that sit around in robes thinking of funny stuff that's going to go viral on the internet. Once you've had a viral hit on the internet, you're going to make money. The biggest problem with that, we've never actually had a viral hit on the internet. We've never had anything that's gone, like national, anything that people all around the world would recognize us for. <clears throat> uh, the closest thing we had was this guy who's an employee of ours named Dylan who uh, fell asleep one day. <laughs> and uh, our designer, John, took a picture of him and then photoshopped him into a taco show. <laughs> and uh, we put that online, and for some reason, this really hit a nerve with people. <laughs> they were like, yeah, I can relate to this guy. And so they asked us to photoshop him into other stuff. So he was on a water slide. <clears throat> uh, this is at the Republican National Convention with Clint Eastwood. I was doing Michael Jackson. <laughs> It's like, get a look at Dylan. Uh, you're the king of the world, Dylan. Uh, when we did this, we realized that Iron Maiden shirts really fit into Game of Thrones well. Um, actually, the whole cast could probably wear an Iron Maiden shirts. This is from the State Fair edition that we did uh, with Obama and then Sarah Palin. Uh, we have dozens and dozens and dozens of these that we did for fun. The biggest problem is that it's hard to make money uh, with photoshopped images of a guy sleeping. Um, so really, we set rules for ourselves to operate. We are like a hardworking indie band. We don't have huge national hits. We have a customer base that we just work. And the, we stay inside a couple rules. One, we're going to be a brick and mortar based store primarily. Uh, between Des Moines, Iowa City, Kansas City, we'll open up other stores. Even though the internet is like the hot new thing, uh, we like brick and mortar based for two reasons. One, we're good at it. And two, I actually like opening up stores, talking to people adding to a community. Uh, two, we'll stay small. Uh, Midwestern only. We're not gonna open up outside the 12 states in the Midwest. It's kind of like a backwards, lame exclusivity, like a members only Applebee's. <clears throat> uh, three, we're gonna control our distribution. So we print everything ourselves. We don't work with national chains, publicly held corporations. Um, we can keep everything in house. We only wholesale to other little stores. And then four, everything will be con humorous, consistent, print design centric. Uh, a lot of people come in and go, do you guys know all your stuff kind of looks the same? It's like, oh my God, you're right. Why, why did we buy the Photoshop package with only one font? We can't even use Comic Sans. I know it only saved us a dollar. Um, it kind of looks the same on purpose. Uh, when we look at the store, one of our favorite symbols is like a sideways spiral. We start at the outside and slowly work our way towards the brand. Um, it's more, instead of just one thing, everything's about the process. If you're gonna run a company like this, it's now been 10 years since I've been doing it. And so you have to like the day-to-day -day of things changing. Everything's a work in progress. It's not a static thing. But when I focus on, you know, just the ideas or the humor of it, or the basic rules, we start to wander into like dare to soar territory. <laughs> that all it takes to run Ray Gun is like a great attitude, and if you have a great attitude and great ideas, you will succeed. Unfortunately, most of what I do is summiting Mount Busy work. Uh, the ideas, the having fun at the store accounts for maybe like 7% of our job description. Um, most of our success is built on three things. One, I show up. Two, I work. I had work hard, but I'm like, eh, I'm just gonna leave it at work. Um, I put in about 31,000 hours with just ray gun, not even counting what I did before in college or high school. When we hire new employees and they're like, what are the rules? I'm like, just show up and work hard. They're like, that's it? And you're like, what? Uh -uh. We've had to fire people. Number three, I reply to all of my emails. This is what really has set me apart over the years. Uh, when you are in the real world, dependability trumps all else. When you're in school, you're, you know, if you're doing art, your art may be judged on subjective material compared to other dead people's art. 
Um, when you are in the world of business and art, you are judged by if it is done, by the, when it's gonna be done by, and if it meets the bare minimum of requirements. If you can reply to all of your emails in a timely manner, the sky is the limit. <laughs> if there's one thing I can tell to you to take away, keep that in mind. Um, the other thing to realize is that there are things you can control, things you can't. There's known knowns, unknown knowns, and unknown unknowns, as the, one of the philosophers of our time said. Um, the also, one of the ideas is that the early days of a company are hard. So you'll read about a lot of tech companies. It's like, oh, well, we were working out of our garage, and we were losing money, and then we sold uh, the company for like billions of dollars six months later. This is one of the early bank statements uh, from the company after six months. I was down to $2,917 in, <laughs> in total money. It's weird to sit and be running a company and be like, wow, it's unbelievable. Anyone shopping in the store doesn't realize we're slow, close to insolvency. But it's not that you get over this little hump in the beginning and then it's smooth sailing. You'll realize that if you're in for work and you're trying to grow something, it will be difficult uh, at many different stages. <clears throat> so this is just this May. Uh, there was some basic stuff. Uh, bank account was at $12,000. Available credit, $3,000. American Express, due June 2nd, was $87,000. <laughs> Income left, seventy-two. dollars Expenses out, $30,000. 30, which means a shortfall of $33,000 in 17 days. Uh, minus $33,000 really makes $2,000 look pretty good. On top of that, my cat's got fleas. <laughs> it's like, oh man, oh. I'm trying to figure out money and now I have to vacuum the house two times a day. Uh, my oldest son got chicken pox that week. Uh, which we didn't really address right away because we were like, oh man, the flea is really biting. <laughs> it's like they've gotten our son. For some reason, not the other ones though. Oh, it's chicken pox. Um, we also had our third son was only two months old by that point and was screaming more than usual. Secondly, my wife is from Scotland. Uh, we were supposed to go visit her parents, but then her grandmother uh, was dying in Delaware, and so we had to cancel that trip. And as I wrote that, I thought to myself, man, dying in Delaware would be a ter terrible romantic comedy title. <laughs> Dying in Delaware, starring Paul Rudd. Uh, during all of that though, it was on Garrison Keillor, so even when things are going badly, you kind of put on a strong face, and it's like, <laughs> Lake Wobegon, does anybody have $33,000 for this young man? When you're in situations like this, uh, it is like being in a vice. And not a cool vice, like drinking or smoking. Or Miami. Um, it's kind of what sets people apart. When in May I was thinking about it, you're like, you know what? <laughs> if this were easy, everybody would do it. I mean, there's a reason why there are few people who get to this point. It's not about necessarily ideas. Um, it's about who can sift through this kind of stuff. No matter how good your work is, you will be sorted out by how well you respond to adversity. Uh, if you want to be a leadership a leader, or if you want to be leadership, if you want to just be the <laughs> adjective. Um, it's about self-control. You know, who can control something, who can control themselves, who can't. Uh, no matter how good your intangible ideas are, uh, your vision and whatnot, uh, if you run out of tangibles, like money, <laughs> your intangibles don't matter a whole lot. So I tried to break down things like this. If you find yourself in a situation where things seem stacked against you, uh, number one, start making a list. Everything should start with lists. Break down the exact problem. A lot of people are afraid of something that seems large and unmanageable. Uh, once you break it down, you'll find what the core issue is. Two, chart the specific steps to solve that problem. Options for option A, option B, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, while you're at it, you wanna see if this problem is something temporary, something endemic. Is it something you're just facing once or is there something built into your operation that'll lead to this problem again and again? Uh, four, keep all options on the table. Uh, nothing should be sacred in terms of staff, ideas, everything has to be, there should be a reason for everything you're doing. Five, another important thing is to run perfect play in your head. Cover all scenarios. Uh, think about exactly what you're gonna do. If A happens, I do B. If B happens, I do D. This could be for anything. 
Uh, if you're gonna go meet with somebody, if you're gonna interview, think, if they ask me this, this is how I respond. If they ask me this, this is how I respond. A lot of my stuff will seem like just kind of off the cuff casual remarks. <laughs> uh, almost everything that we'll do is thought out or planned or catchphrases. Um, kind of the thinking ahead is what sets us apart. <clears throat> In that particular situation, number one was easy to see. Uh, the core problem was that we were $33,000 short. Uh, two options were also pretty easy to see. You could either expand the line of credit, you could sell personal assets, uh, you could ask a friend from college who went to law school for money. <clears throat> uh, three, it wasn't really a serious problem. In terms of income coming in, we had just opened the Kansas City store. What we had said was May is a slower month, June, July are busier months, which indicated since May was up, June should be up even higher, July should be up even higher. Um, everything should work out, which it did. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. I'd get invited as like, company failure, Mike Draper, here to speak. <laughs> um, but there's no guarantees in life. I mean, if you will notice, our main options were driven by the past. We assumed that the summer would be better than the spring, but you still don't know what it's gonna be. When we're opening up a new store, we have an established brand, we have an established company which means we know the expense side of, of a profit loss statement pretty easily. We know what our build out's gonna be, we know what our salary's gonna be, we know what the timeline's gonna be. You still don't know if anybody's gonna shop there. There's risk to everything. Um, and usually the nuts and bolts of an operation aren't too hard. There's people that step up and do it and people who don't. <laughs> our stuff is not difficult to grasp. It is all in one font, it's funny slogans. Everyone has funny ideas for t-shirts. There is rarely a time when I go out in public that people don't offer me funny ideas for t-shirts. <laughs> um, but modern art is, I could do that plus, but yeah, you didn't. <clears throat> um, if you learn to play five to six chords on a guitar, you can play almost all punk rock. If you learn a few more chords on the guitar, you can play half the stuff you hear on the radio. It's not meant to be difficult, it's who steps up and does it. Uh, enjoy the day-to-day -day life. Again, like I said, I like what I'm doing. <laughs> That is why I do it. Uh, this is not some like pyramid scheme. It's not like a tech company. I'm not looking to turn around and sell to a large company for millions of dollars. I do this because I like doing it. Um, there's not a lot else I enjoy. Um, do what you get satisfaction from. I mean, add to the community. The reason why I moved back to Des Moines from Philadelphia was that I felt like I was actually needed here when I was out east. It was like I answered the call that New York City never put out. <laughs> and you get out and suddenly it's like, oh man, there's a lot of people from the Midwest here. Um, Des Moines was a city that actually appreciated what we were gonna do. It's nice to be a part of something uh, bigger than you. And there are a few, I would say, truths in life. One, the thing I realized most of all from going to Penn to studying to building up a huge resume, um, no amount of other people being impressed with your stuff or no amount of society saying that you should be on one path is going to make you draw satisfaction from that path. There's things that you like doing, things that you don't like doing. Um, you may as well just stick with what you do like doing. <clears throat> because as they say in wearing sunscreen, the race is long, and in the end, it's only with yourself. The end.